uh, third peak R process elements. Uh, but the early light curves uh, from the EPASTO paper, which I didn't show here, but the early light curve is dominated by light from perhaps um, uh, lighter R process elements. Um, so what we need to consider is that when you have heavier elements in the ejecta, this is going to lead to an increase in the opacity. So you're going to see a transient that evolves slowly in the infrared. And because this thing evolves so quickly in the infrared, this is perhaps evidence for an opacity of order this, perhaps smaller, of this kind of value. Um, but it could be possible, due to orientation effects, that there are heavy elements there, but we just don't see them until a later time. And then there's a discussion whether the eject is 9 to 9, 4, and this kind of fraction, or perhaps it's still a low fraction, but no two orders of magnitude greater. But what there, there is kind of general consensus uh, on the velocity of the ejecta and loosely how much was ejected during the event. So as we mentioned, so we saw the gravitational wave, we talked about the kilonova, the GRB itself. Um, it was detected by uh, Fermi GBM, also by Integral. Its duration was of order of short GRB, uh, some certainty in its duration. Its gamma rays, this number seems to be highly uh, unknown. I think I saw this number uh, quoted in this Troja paper in terms of the isotropic energy release in gamma rays, but I'm not 100% confident about this. It's not talked about a lot. Uh, what people do pre uh, present is the, of the GRB spectrum, its peak energy of this value here. And in terms of these numbers, it's a pretty normal GRB, uh, uh, short duration GRB, but actually it's one that's seen off axis. So the X-ray light curve was, detect was not detected until after about a week and a half. And this is interpreted as a seeing this GRB off axis. And when you start modeling millimeter, submillimeter radio observations as well as the X-ray, you can come up with a couple scenarios where we're seeing this, this off-axis GRB jet, which might have an energy in this range. It might have a half opening angle of these values. And it's really hard to distinguish between these two scenarios. And we're misaligned. We've got a viewing angle of anywhere, say, 15 to 40 uh, degrees, something like that. And an independent analysis of uh, Swift UVOT and new star data, they also uh, suggest a viewing angle of about 30 degrees. And last but not least, there's been a lot of questions about the remnants left over. Could it be a hypermassive neutron star or a black hole? We simply don't know. Uh, there's a very interesting paper on the archive today by LIGO who went back and looked for gravitational waves after the event itself. Um, perhaps pulsations from a, a, a neutron star, something like this, and they couldn't find anything. They were only able to place up limits. So what's left over, we don't quite know. And the last slide. So thank you very much for listening. What I would want you to take away from you today is that we've had this amazing gravitational wave, GRB, electromagnetic event, where for the first time we've both seen and heard an astrophysical event. It's a, a merger of a binary neutron star system. The GRB is pretty average looking short duration GRB albeit one seen off axis, and we have for the first time obtained this amazing spectroscopic data of a kilonova. Uh, in terms of long duration GRB supernovae, they're very rare, they're very bright, they're very energetic. I would argue that they are powered by radioactive heating, except for 2011 KL, which is magnetar powered or a combination of all physical processes. And GRB supernovae have a luminosity decline relationship that allows them to be used uh, in GRB supernova cosmology in the future. So thank you very much. Of additional satellites in the late 1990s, the Beppo Sachs, a Dutch Italian satellite, as well as being able to detect gamma ray emission, we can detect X ray afterglows. X ray afterglows are pinpoint uh, you know, a couple, two, three arc seconds. You then turn your optical telescopes at the position of the X ray afterglow, and it was very quickly realized once the first X ray afterglow was obtained, we saw host galaxies, we obtained spectroscopic redshifts, and it was actually decided and determined that these things occur at cosmological distances, and therefore you need very extreme sorry, here, physical phenomena to produce these events in the first place. The other landmark discovery of the Batsy experiment was this discovery that there are probably two, if not more, populations of gamma ray bursts, dubbed short duration and long duration GRBs, where for the Batsy experiment, the dividing line between these two populations is about two seconds. So, how do we think GRBs are produced? Ah, so this is for the movie. So here's an NASA animation of how we think a GRB is produced. 
here we have a collapsing, uh, the, the core of massive stars collapse, it's created a black hole, an accretion disk is, disk is formed, and this accretes material onto it, leading to a pair of bipolar jets being created. If I do this, will it replay? There we go. And so within this uh, ultra relativistic jet, you have blobs of material that interact with each other, and this is what leads to the generation of gamma rays. Actually, in the co moving frame, they're, re they're generated mostly as <coughs> uh -huh. uh, mostly as X rays, but because the Doppler shifted towards us, we detect them as gamma rays. Now, as this blob, these blobs of material collide with the, inter with the surrounding material, the surrounding medium, we have another set of shocks that are created, we call this an external shock wave, where electrons in this material are heated up, and then they cool very rapidly and release that energy in the form of synchrotron radiation. So this is how we think a general GRB is formed. And actually, this part doesn't matter. All you need is some physical process to be able to generate a pair of bipolar jets so that you end up having interaction material within that jet leading to the generation of the, um, of the gamma rays in the first place. What do we think produces this scenario? Well, here we can see a collapsing massive star. I'll come back to that. Oh, and the first scenario for... Short duration GRB, the proposed scenario is a, a, a binary system uh, consisting of two compact objects. One of them needs to be a neutron star, and here we can see that they're over each other, and as the orbital separation decreases, that energy is released as gamma rays, and here we have this energetic explosion. So we saw the jets being propelled off into space very quickly. We have this supernova-like transient left over afterwards, and then the collision of this jet with the surrounding medium producing the afterglow and x-rays, radio waves, optical, so on and so forth. Okay. So, oh, we should probably stay here because for the next animation, we're going to show how we think a long duration GRB is formed. I'm not going to worry too much about that, but here we have the core collapse of a massive star. The stars retain a lot of angular momentum at the time of collapse. This is, and then when the core finally collapses underneath its own weight, that angular momentum is translated uh, into the formation of an accretion disk. And then, as we said before, uh, accretion of material from the disk onto the compact object leads to this pair of bipolar jets being uh, created, which then drill through the star and escape out into space. And if we happen to be somewhere near the line of sight of this jet, we'll see it as a long duration GRB. Okay, great. But how do we know that's the case? These are very nice theoretical scenarios, some really pretty animations, but how do we actually know what we know? Well, up until the end of last year, perhaps even up until uh, August of this year, we kind of knew where short GRBs came from, but we weren't 100% sure. We can't, we can't um, image these systems directly. We have to, to infer it indirectly from the observations. I'll come back to SGRBs in, in a little while, but what I want to talk about now are long duration GRBs. Why do we know that they uh, arise from the core collapse of a massive star? Well, it's because when you look at the position of a GRB, and you can localize it very precisely, when you then look, you might see an X-ray afterglow, you might see an optical afterglow, and what appears after a little while is a supernova. So here is one of the most famous cases, 980425, and it's associated supernova 1998BW. This is a type 1C supernova. This means we don't see any hydrogen or helium lines in its spectrum, in its spectra, I should say. Um, and to date, this was the first hint that long-duration GRBs arise from the core collapse of a massive star, and after 20 years, it is still our best example of this scenario. After 20 years, this is still the closest event. So, uh, very small redshift, it's a linear distance of about 3840 megaparsecs of that order. And so this close proximity to Earth allowed the astronomers to obtain these very well-sampled UV VRL light curves and these very high signal-to-noise spectroscopic time series. So it's a type 1C supernova, but it's actually a type 1C broadline supernova. And what I mean by that is that material within the ejecta moves at very large velocities. At peak light, the material can still be moving at 20,000, even 30,000 kilometers per second. So there's very large velocity dispersions of the elements within the ejecta, which causes these spectral features, when the velocity is high, to merge into each other. So we see these very broad absorption features, especially early on in the photospheric uh, spectrum. 
But although this was a very nice um, hint at the connection of GRBs with the core collapse of massive stars, uh, there's a lot of questions raised because in terms of its energetics in gamma rays, it's actually under energetic and under luminous compared with the typical GRB, uh, typical long duration GRB. It's under energetic by a few orders of magnitude and under luminous by a couple orders of magnitude. So as soon as this thing was detected, we had to ask, actually ask ourselves, was it actually representative and a good proxy of all long duration GRBs, or was this just a special event in the local universe and long GRBs arise from something a little bit different? So uh, fast forward another five years, and here we have cosmological GRB 030329. This is a very peculiar, really, event in terms of its optical properties, but in terms of its uh, gamma ray properties, it's a normal long duration GRB. Its energetics is in excess of 10 to the 52 ergs. Its luminosity is exactly what you expect for long duration GRB. And its distance of almost 0.17 at a distance of 7, 800 megaparsecs means that in terms of its distance and its energetics, it's a real cosmological GRB. And it is actually, and it had an associated supernova, 2003 DH. And so in this spectroscopic time series here, here we have 2003 DH, and plotted for comparison, thanks to the excellent data set obtained of 90 ABW, which we use as a reference point for every other GRB supernova detected since then, we can see that for a similar post-explosion epoch, the shape of the spectra are pretty similar. So, and when you decompose the optical light curve, so here is light from the afterglow. This thing decays with power law-like behavior, synchrotron radiation. And when you try to quantify the behavior of this light curve, you can see it's a combination of the decaying power, uh, afterglow and light from the company supernova. And again, 1990 APW is used as a template. So for lack of a better phrase, a better term, this was a smoking gun confirmation that all long duration GRBs arise from the core collapse of a massive star. And since then, very fuzzy, but you can take my word for it. When I started putting this list together for the review in the middle of 2015, there were 46 events. And because these things occur over a wide range of redshifts, from very nearby, as we saw from 90 APW, all the way up to, say, a redshift of one, another one here, we have different degrees of the quality of that obtained uh, uh, data sets. In fact, some of the best data sets that have been obtained of GRB supernovae have been over the past five or 10 years and using excellent telescopes, large after telescopes such as the GTC and the program that uh, Antonio established here in the HEF group. So this is probably missing a couple of events, but this is our contribution to the GRB supernova field over the past half decade or so. So we've had a nature paper on a very peculiar event as well as several other publications that have performed in-depth investigations of different GRB supernovae. So in terms of Heth's contribution, Spain's contribution to GRB supernova science, we've been very pro uh, productive and we've formed a large part of the analysis in, local, in recent times. So uh, if you're interested, a lot of the data are available on Antonio's website, and you can of course ask me for more information on these events. So more in the general properties of GRB supernovae, here's a mosaic of what a lo typical long duration GRB supernova looks like. Now what we need to keep in mind is that we need to be able to remove it. Then the second component is light from the opt optical afterglow, which is bright early on, but it fades away according to a power law. And then the third component is light from the supernova itself. So what we're looking at in this mosaic here is we've removed the host light. So we're just looking at light from the afterglow and then from the supernova. And here, here's a really nice example, 1302A. This one here where we see this broken power law behavior of the afterglow, and then the onset of light from the supernova itself. And then we can see this behavior repeated for many other events. Spectroscopically, so we have again a um, 1990 BW, and then all of the spectra that were published to date of GRV supernovae. It's not a lot actually, and these are obtained as close to peak light as, as was possible to obtain them. And we can see that for the most part, in general, the, the spectra of GRV supernovae kind of matched that of 1990 APW. There's a general kind of behavior there. There is one notable example, however, and this is 2011 KL. Now, this is a very unique event, and I'm going to come back to this a few times within the talk. This was associated with a very interesting GRB, which we call an ultra-long duration GRB, where the duration of the prompt emission, that burst of gamma rays, wasn't just 5, 10, 20, 100 seconds, it was many thousands of seconds. 
This is a very interesting uh, case. Now what we can see here that, unlike the other spectrum where we can see some undulations associated with the absorption of different features in the, in the, in the supernova ejecta, this thing is very flat and featureless. Very flat here and then the, sh the sharp decrease blue words of about 3,000 angstroms. This hints that the, this gives us a hint that the physical processes that power the luminosity of GRB supernovae in this event is different to all other events. And I'll come back to this later on. Uh, the other thing that the spectroscopy is telling us are some properties of the, the progenitor star at the time of explosion. So as I mentioned before, GRB supernovae are type 1c. There's no hydrogen lines, there's no helium lines, and so we attribute this to the fact that the progenitor star at the time of the explosion has lost both its hydrogen and its helium envelope, so that when this star explodes, it's very compact. And this makes a lot of sense to us, because for uh, the, the jet that's created by the central engine, which operates typically maybe 20, 30 seconds, if you have a central engine in a star with extended hydrogen and helium envelopes, that jet will not operate long enough for it to bore through the star and escape out into space. That jet will explode somewhere on the inside. Whereas if the star is very compact and operates for 20, 30 seconds, that central engine can power that jet long enough for it to escape into space and then generate the prompt emission far away from the exploding star. So we have this general idea that the genders of GRB supernovae, 1C supernovae in general, are very compact and very strict by the time that they explode. So another nice mosaic from Alex's paper on 2011 KL. And if we bring attention to 2011 KL here, we can see that in terms of its bolometric luminosity, it's much brighter than the other GRB supernova sample, uh, supernovae that Alex has considered in this paper. And we can see for the most part that GRB supernovae near peak light kind of cluster near this peak value of 10 to 43 years per second, a luminosity. Uh, of 10 to 43 years per second. There are some exceptions. There was this low luminosity 10.03.16d in a supernova 2010bh, which is this guy here. It's under luminous. So there, there's a spread in these values, but we can see that none are as luminous as 2011kl. Again, this is, tell us, this is telling us that something very special is occurring in this event. And so plotted for comparison, here we have the light curve of nearby 1987a, slow evolving, not near as luminous. And here we have the bolometric light curve of a type 1c superluminous supernova. This is 2012 uh, DAM. Yeah, here we go here. We can see it evolves much slower, and it's about an order of magnitude more luminous than your typical GRB supernova. So we have this very peculiar, very interesting event in 2011 KL, which is the most luminous GRB supernova to date, and it seems to occupy this region in this diagram in between Berks. Now this is about 10 times more energetic than a typical core collapse supernova, where perhaps your typical 1b, 1c, and type 2s have a kinetic energy of a couple of times 10 to the 51 herbs. So this is a very energetic event. Uh, typically it has an ejecta mass of about 6 solar masses, and the nickel content therein is about 4 tenths of a solar mass. The ejecta velocity at peak line is about 20,000 kilometers per second, with the corresponding spreads. As I mentioned, the peak volumetric luminosity is about 10 to the 43 hours per second, and it reaches peak volumetric light in just under a couple of weeks. So now I want to take a couple uh, close looks at a couple different types of phenomenology about GRB supernova. And the first thing I want to ask ourselves is that we can determine what are the physical processes that power the luminosity. The obvious candidates are radioactive heating, and emission arising from a millisecond magnetar central engine. So in the radioactive heating scenario, during the core collapse event itself, you have a certain amount of radioactive nickel that's nuclear synthesized, a few tenths of the solar mass, and as that nickel decays into its daughter products of cobalt and into iron, it releases energetic gamma rays. These gamma rays thermalize in the ejecta, causing it to heat up and thus shine. The other, the other possible process is emission arising from a magnetar central engine where you have this rapidly rotating, uh, highly magnetized neutron star, and then you can extract dipole radiation from the central engine, which can then power the supernova. Now, this millisecond magnetar engine is what's been popularly used over the last few years to explain the bright luminosity of superluminous supernovae of type 1c. 
So how can we try to distinguish between these two models? Well, the first thing we can look at is the models themselves and ask themselves, what do they predict in the decay in the behavior of the late time light curves? So for radioactive heating, you have an exponential decay here. And so we're, we're not interested in the photospheric phase here whatsoever. All we need to make sure is that these lines pass through the peak of the observations here so that we can start to investigate the phases down here. And we can see that for the t to the minus 2, that at late times the evolution is much different to what we see in the observations. There's a little bit better agreement between um, the, the predictions from the radioactive heating model. Here we can see that decay rates are approximately similar, but again, of course, there are differences. This is not a perfect model either. Perhaps some of the difference between the radioactive decay model and the observations on this late time can be attributed to the fact that in this simple model, we make the assumption that every single gamma ray that's produced during the radioactive decay of nickel into cobalt, cobalt into iron, is thermalized in the ejecta. Now, this is an oversimplification because definitely at these late phases, the, uh, the ejecta is essentially optically thin. So some of those gamma rays that are generated will not interact with the ejecta. They will simply escape into space, carrying that energy away. So the fact that we have an over-prediction luminosity between the radioactive decay model and the observations actually is a little bit reassuring. It makes a little bit of sense. Uh, but what about the rest? Okay. How did I do this? All right, so let's come back to 2011 KL. So there have been some previous papers who investigated this event, including a study we published last year and some other studies here. And so what's the big deal? So here we have the spectrum of 2011 KL, this fellow here. So this is a nature paper by Joachim Greiner et al. from a couple of years ago. And here we can see the spectrum of peak light compared with the spectrum of 1990 ABW our archetype, our typical GRB supernova, and already visually we can see how different they are. These undulations here are completely absent in the spectrum, which is pretty much flat and featureless, and perhaps there's a hint of some absorption from some higher peak elements here in blue. And we compare these with a sample of uh, type 1C superluminous supernovae, we can see that there's a little bit better agreement between the spectrum of 2011 KL with the superluminous supernovae relative to the typical GRB supernova. So this already is telling us that there is a fundamental difference between 2011 KL and that of 1998 W. So in this paper, using a one-dimensional, uh, a 1D radiator transfer model, which considers emission arising from Magnetar central engine with a magnetic field strength of 10 to the 15 Gauss and its initial spin period in the range of 2 to 13 milliseconds, able to reproduce these synthetic spectra. So here's for different photospheric velocities, and here are the three different synthetic spectra. We can see that's a pretty good agreement there. So it appears that the spectra are more consistent as being powered by a Magnetar central engine. A second line of evidence that perhaps radioactive heating is not at play in this event, or is not dominant in this event, is when we go back and we consider the volumetric light curve of 2011 KL. So when you fit this with a simple uh, radio radioactive heating model, where the peak luminosity is dependent on how much radioactive material is present in the ejecta, and the width of that light curve is a proxy for how much total mass is ejected during the event, that when you fit that model to the volumetric light curve, you come up with a ratio between the two which is probably unphysically large. If this thing is powered entirely by radioactive heating, it requires one solar mass of nickel when only a bit over three solar masses of ejected were uh, in the whole event. This ratio is much too large. And when you consider this ratio, for a sample of GRB supernova, it's about four times larger than what you would expect. And it may be unphysically large. So, yeah, okay. So I'm going to come back to that in a minute. What, so I, I will argue here that for this event, this is probably powered by a magnetar or a combination of a magnetar and radioactive heating. But what about the rest? So, Let's uh, consider a sample of long duration GRB supernova, and here we can see the behavior we saw before. So the host light's been subtracted out, so all we have left is the, uh, the afterglow behavior, and then the supernova peak itself. And so, I want to take a step back, and we want to ask ourselves, can a millisecond magnetar model, can a millisecond magnetar be responsible for powering all phases of this GRB supernova event, both the afterglow and the supernova itself? And so what the model considers is that, if you remember our animation where the jet slams into the CSM, 
and it creates uh, the initial afterglow that starts fading away. We have this initial event here, which is dictated by this uh, dashed gray line. And this is then going to be powered by a millisecond magnetar, where the millisecond magnetar powers this event for a long period of time. Maybe it's a few days, maybe it's a week, maybe it's a month, something like this. Just as like we've um, invoked for superluminous supernovae. And we have a physical scenario that early on, when the, when the, 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 the central engine is very energetic, and the spin period is still very fast, it's able to maintain the collimation of the jets through the ejecta. So for a certain period of time, these jets are very collimated, and they can drill not only through the, the star itself, but also through the supernova as well, thus powering the afterglow very far away. But over time, as this uh, central engine spins down and it's losing energy, it loses its ability to maintain the collimation of the jets. So the jets start to wobble, the jets start to spread out, and it loses its ability to drill a hole through the supernova itself, and instead it deposits that energy via these wider jets into the expanding supernova remnant itself. So we have a scenario where we have an early afterglow powered by energy injection from the, from the millisecond magnetar, but as it loses its ability to maintain that hole in the ejecta, it then powers the subsequent supernova. So the sum of these three components, the magnetar powered supernova, the magnetar powered afterglow, and that initial event when the jet collides with the CSM, these three combine to create this red, uh, solid red line here. And as you can see, we have a very nice agreement early on for the, for the afterglow phase, but the supernova is underluminous. And in this case, it's underluminous by a factor of 3.5. So if we mu multiply this phase by 3.5, which translates to about 2 tenths of solar mass of nickel, we can then get the model to reproduce the observations. So what we can say here is that in this simple model, the energy from a millisecond magnetar is not enough to power all phases. You need an additional source of, of energy here, which I would argue comes from radioactive heating. Um, skip that. So reproduce this analysis on a small sample of long duration GRBs. So here's the uh, magnetar powered afterglow, the initial collision, the magnetar powered uh, supernova, and this red line is the sum of these three components. And as we can see, in five of these six cases, this red line here is not luminous enough to match the luminosity of the super during the supernova phase. There is one exception, however. Our ultra-long GRB 11209A. So in these normal, what you call normal long duration GRB supernovae, you need an additional source of heating to power the supernova phase, uh, which is anywhere in the range of, say, a tenth and a half up to four tenths of solar mass of nickel. And I'd just like to point out, so as we showed in the paper, that you cannot fit 1998 BW by the magnetar model alone. You still need an additional source of heating. And same applies for 2010 BH. Okay, so as you might have saw in the plot, the one um, scenario, the one event where this model does seem to work is for this very uh, ultra-long, very strange, ultra-long GRB 1112-09A, and it's supernova 2011 KL. And in fact, the model during the supernova phases over predicts the luminosity by a factor of about 10%. And so in our modeling, here's our best fitting parameters for the diffusion time scale, the initial spin period of that central engine, and the magnetic field. And we can see that there's pretty good agreement between the different analyses. So in our analysis, and that in the Nature paper, the supernova component is powered purely by a magnetar. Whereas in these two papers down here, they make an assumption that there is already during the explosion, two, uh, two tenths of a solar mass of radioactive nickel there to help power the supernova. So for this, for all long duration GRB supernovae, well, okay, this one event, you could argue that's powered purely by a magnetar, or you could argue that's powered by a combination of a magnetar and radioactive heating, but what we could say with quite a lot of confidence is that it's not powered just by radioactive heating. This is the supernova component. Whereas for long duration GRBs, you could argue that the supernova themselves are powered just by radioactivity. Okay, maybe you could argue for a combination of a magnetar and radioactivity. But what we could say with a high degree of confidence is that GRB supernovae, the supernova component itself, cannot be powered exclusively by a magnetar central engine. <clears throat> okay, I'll try to push on a little bit. So this is the last aspect about long duration GRBs I want to talk about before I move on to today's main event. And I want to talk about GRB supernovae as cosmological probes, as standardizable candles. So just a little bit of background. Here we have a very uh, plot from a very famous paper by Adam Reese et al. from 1998, where they have used type 1a supernovae here in a Hubble diagram to try to work out 
uh, the energy and mass uh, densities of the cosmos. And for these different methods for calibrating the supernova 1A, supernova 1A are not standard candles. They have a range of luminosities. But they are standardizable because there is, a, there is a link between the peak brightness and the shape of their light curves. And so when you correct for this, uh, when you correct for this using different methods, you can reduce the amount of scatter in your Hubble diagram and try to distinguish between the different models. And as we are all aware of, the model that the best fits the data is for something like uh, a quarter uh, uh, mass dominated by dark matter, and three quarters dark energy, all the way back in 1998. And so why are these things standardizable? Well, they're standardizable because of this relation between the peak uh, luminosity and the shape of their light curves. So here is a plot from another famous paper by Mark Phillips in 1993, where we're looking at for a sample of type 1A supernovae, their absolute magnitude, so brighter down to fainter, versus this delta M15 parameter which is basically a measurement of how fat or how skinny the light curve is. So for those of that you don't know, this delta M15 parameter is basically a measurement of how much the light curve fades from peak light to 15 days later. So the light curves that are fatter are going to have a smaller delta M15, they're going to fade less over 15 days, over those that are skinnier, which are obviously going to fade more over this 15 day period. And what we can say, see here is that there is a correlation between the, the brighter supernovae fading slower, and the fainter supernovae fading a lot faster. Okay? Um, and so this is called the Phillips relation, and it's also called a luminosity decline relationship. And because supernovae 1A have this, uh, this characteristic, we can first calibrate them to the luminosity decline relationship, put them into the Hubble diagram, and reduce the amount of scatter that we see here. Well, interestingly, it turns out that GRB supernovae also have a luminosity decline relationship. So different observables can be fainter supernovae and a stretch factor, skinnier, fatter light curves. So we can see as well that they also have a luminosity decline relationship. Brighter supernovae fade slower. What is this K and this S? Well, if we recall the mosaic from several slides ago of the long duration GRB, so there are three phases of light here, three sources of light here. There's light from the host galaxy, there's light from the optical glow, and light from the supernova. So if we subtract the host magnitude, host flux off, we result in this diagram here where we can see the very clear supernova bump. So for this event, this is GRB 090618. This is a cosmological GRB. It's a redshift of 0 0.54. And at 0 0.54, rest frame V band just happens to be redshifted in between observer frame R band and I band. And we're interested in the precise rest frame properties of these supernovae. We want to know how does it evolve with this rest frame V band, rest frame V, so on and so forth. Well, for this four one event, we can determine what it's doing in precise B bands. So for each one of these epochs, we create uh, spectral energy distributions, we then interpolate to rest, a redshifted rest frame V band, extract out its flux, and then recreate its B-band light curve. And then because we're interested in the properties of the supernova itself, how bright it is, and how wide the supernova light curve is, simply model the afterglow with the phenomenological model, this broken power law, the synchrotron radiation, you subtract that away, and then you're left with the supernova light curve. And then we simply take our template supernova, again, we're using 1990 APW because it's so well observed, it has these excellent light curves, we K-correct it, we stick it at the same redshift of 90618, and then we see how much we need to take the light curve of the supernova associated with the 90618, and how much we need to make it brighter or fainter, and skinnier and fatter, relative to 1998 BW. And then you plug this in, you, do, you repeat this for a whole range of GRB supernovae, and then plot them up, and we can see that the brighter GRB supernovae fades slower. So I'm not going to talk any more about GRB supernovae in cosmology now. I've been spending a lot of time on this work. I've been able to use GRB supernovae to determine the Hubble constant in the local universe. And I'm currently working on extending the Hubble diagram to include cosmological events where we can start to put some constraints on omega matter, omega dark energy, uh, in the same way that we can for type 1As. They're never going to rival type 1A supernovae. They're simply too rare. There are too many type 1As. But it's a complementary probe but they're definitely not there to, re uh, to replace type 1As. 
So for today's main event, and thank you for uh, sticking along with me. So coming back to short duration GRBs now, we're done with the long duration GRBs. And a prediction of the, the model for short duration GRBs, i.e. This, this merger, this coalescence of the binary neutron star system, or a binary system with black hole and neutron stars, is that a consequence of that is that you should see a faint supernova-like transient, which has been called previously a merger nova, or as people seem to be using now, a killer nova. The evidence prior to 2016, actually prior to August 16th, uh, 2017, evidence for the existence of killer nova was pretty sparse. So there was a Nature paper from a few years ago by Neil Tan Baratow, where using HST data, they showed that in their um, J H band, H band I think, uh, light curve, that there was an excess of flux. And this excess of flux was kind of what you expect from your simple kilonova, theoretical kilonova models. This is based on simply one data point, so it's it's compelling, but it's not comp it's not uh, definitive. Another event was analysis that we looked at of GRB 060614, which. Maybe a short duration GRB, we don't know. But under the assumption that it is a short duration GRB, if we decompose the optical light curves just the same way that we do for long duration GRBs, so you remove the host flux and then you model the early afterglow and look to see if there's any excess of light, what's left over kind of looks like a kilonova. And the, the advantage of this analysis is that instead of single data points or this lower limit on colors between R and H bands, we have some color, some spectral information. And we can see that early on, this SED is described by a power law. This is what you expect for synchrotron dominated radiation. But over time, so here we've got a week, here we've got almost two weeks, that it steepens. And then when you fit this with a combination of a, a synchrotron spectrum and a Planck spectrum, you come up with temperatures of about 3,000, 2,500 Kelvin, which again, is what you loosely expect for a kilonova model. Again, it's kind of interesting, but it's not definitive. And then we had the 17th of August this year, where we had, uh, for the first time, discovery by LIGO and Virgo, not of a binary black hole system, but this time it was a binary neutron star system. And this thing collided and coalesced. The event lasted about 100 seconds. I'm going to put the movie on in seconds. And this was for the first time that for an astronomical event, so I can't, I can't overstate this, that we have both gravitational wave information of an event and electromagnetic radiation of an event. You know, this is, this is very amazing. We are able to see what's going on through the photons and we're able to hear what's going on through the gravitational wave. And I can't take claim to the statement, I heard somebody say this during the LIGO press conference, but I think it's worth stressing nonetheless. So here's a timeline of the different discoveries. So this, the, the, the detection of gravitational waves, and then when it was published to the community, the detection of the gamma ray event, so Fermi GBM, 1.7 seconds after the, GR, uh, the gravitational wave was detected by LIGO and Virgo, which happens to be the brightest, loudest event that they've heard to date. There was a GRB detection a couple seconds later. And that GRB lasted about two seconds, give or take half a second. Um, so the, the localization was uh, published to the world, then we turned our different telescopes, saw nothing in x-ray for ages, eventually saw something after about a week and a half, UV, and then finally optical was detected 10, 12, 14 hours, something like that. I believe the first detection was by the Swope Supernova Survey, SSS 17A, and it also has the ID AT, Astronomical Transient, 2017, get the fuck out. Sorry, GFO. <laughs> okay. So there's some pretty cool... Yeah, okay, so here's one of the uh, media released by LIGO at the time of the press release, and here we can see the system emerging by our neutron star and the corresponding uh, wave function, wavelets. I think this thing was detected for like 100 seconds, so they got it on the in spiral, and then the merger and the subsequent rain down. Pretty cool. And then I want to show another animation, uh, but this time show what it's like to try to chase up a gravitational wave. 
So here's the, the Fermi GBM error box, already kind of big. Wait, ah, uh, the integral error box is huge. Good luck. <laughs> and then we have the LIGO banana, I think, in a second. Here we go, so we have an overlapping region here. And then there's the combined LIGO and Virgo. And I think the Virgo took a little bit of time because this uh, gravitational wave occurred uh, in a blind spot of the Virgo instruments. So I don't know how they did it, but eventually they came up with their own detection. And then within that error region, which is about 28 square degrees, there's this inconspicuous looking S0 galaxy for 993. And is that the killer? <gasps> Movie one, movie two. Okay, so here's HST image uh, of the host galaxy itself, and here we can see the position of the kilonova. So it's a, a typical S0 galaxy. It's at a distance of about 40 megaparsecs, and I guess I didn't say previously, but the modeling of the, the gravitational wave uh, itself uh, came up with these parameters, uh, one components. We make assumptions about its inclination angle and rotation, spin, things like this. One component was about one solar mass, the other one just over two solar masses. Off of the two neutron stars. And its luminosity distance was predicted to be 40 plus or minus 40 percent. <coughs> megaparsecs plus or minus 40 percent. And within this, this was, this, uh, I also want to point out that the sky region at 28 square degrees is huge. But it is, this is huge, right? But compared with previous events, when we were looking for electromagnetic radiation with the binary black hole mergers, where this error box was a factor of 50 larger. We're talking to 1,200 square degrees, 1,400 square degrees. So 28 square, deg square degrees, as well as a distance constraint, this really allowed us uh, a really great possibility to try to find any optical uh, counterpart associated with this event. So here's the host galaxy itself. Uh, this is our Mu's data of uh, nitrogen 2 emission lines. Um, and we can see that there, I hope you can make it out, there are some dust lanes within this image as well. And this was interpreted in the paper as perhaps being an indication of a recent dry merger. And especially perhaps along here, we can see that some of the nitrogen 2 lines track the dust lanes. But it's a, it's a pretty typical S0 kind of galaxy as far as I understand and then the kilonova itself. So there's been a lot of data on this event. I'm sure you all noticed last week uh, on the archive that after the, uh, the press conference, we were allowed to put our papers onto the archive, and I think there were like 67, 70 papers. 76. Seven, thank you, like 76 papers the next day on this event alone. So there are a lot of light curves, there are a lot of spectra, but I want to bring out the ones that we're involved with uh, directly. Uh, so here's some nice R and then uh, Y, J, K light curves of the kilonova itself, and we can see just how quickly this thing evolves. Already we've missed the peak in the R bands, and in the Y band and the J band, this thing peaks after maybe one or two days. And in the K band, it peaks after maybe four days, five days, something like that. So this thing evolves very, very quickly. Um, so when you, when you try to determine the volumetrics of this event, uh, all the different analyses. There's a little bit of consensus in the fact that we think there's anywhere from say two to five uh, percent of solar mass of material ejected during this event. There's a lot of discussion about how much of that was um, lanthanides and actinides in the in the uh, in the ejecta, and whether it's lanthanide rich or it's lanthanide poor, and whether the R process elements are light or they're actually heavy. But the consensus is that the kinetic energy, 10 to the 50-ish ergs, and the velocity around peak light and just after is about 10, 20% speed lights. And what, what I'm still amazed with is this excellent, so these are VLT uh, spectroscopy of the kilonova itself, and the detail here is amazing. So you can fit this thing with Planck function, and you can just see the broad absorption features in the spectra. It's really crazy. Okay, so here's another uh, paper. This is the, the PESTO paper on this event. And here they've used a very simple uh, 1D radiative transfer code, TARDIS, uh, to try to, can't really work out the abundances so well, but maybe for some line identification. And there's a couple 